Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Juan Carlos Brando. I'm one of the um, people in the marketing or not marketing. I'm just an interviewer of one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates. And well, I always like to talk about what's going on in the immigration world, but also informing people what's going on with the immigration decisions, either uh, the USCIS, the DOJ, or USDOS. So um, because I'm not an attorney, I cannot talk about that, but we have one of the experts in the uh, immigration law in the United States. Today we have the attorney, Alison Chan, who is one of the attorneys in the law firm, and she is going to be uh, answering your questions. So if you have any questions today, uh, please feel free to ask your question on the phone number uh, 216-279-3984, or you can write down your question today in our show. We are absolutely live right now, and the attorney will answer your immigration questions. So thank you so much, Attorney Allison, for uh, joining us today and uh, for answering so many questions that we are getting every day. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just a little hot here in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's going to go away very soon. <laughs> it's so, hot here in North Carolina too. So <laughs> yeah. Well, you are, you are, you are not very far from here. That's so, right. um, well, I would like to start by uh, asking or talking about uh, what's happening with um, these new decisions. It looks like um they are there are a lot of dismissals in the cases at the moment and we have seen like it's going up so what's going on why are judges or officers uh dismissing so many cases at this point uh, at this point sure. yeah this has been a um this has been something that's happening a lot in the past month if you remember, I, I guess I can talk a little bit about the history of prosecutorial discretion, which is um, a concept that allows uh, DHS, so the prosecuting attorney, to decide whether to pursue individuals for removal proceedings or to not consider them a priority and to dismiss or not prosecute or uh, pursue their cases. That's prosecutorial discretion. We've, we've always had it. Um, but the way in which it's implemented is uh, depends on who the president is at the time. So under Obama, we had um, prosecutorial discretion uh, under the Mayorkas memo. And at that time, 10 years ago, we were reopening a lot of cases. We were able to close a lot of cases. We were able to get a lot of green cards. Um, a lot of cases were able to proceed forward. Of course, a lot of people also were deported at that time because they were prioritizing criminal aliens and aliens with fraud, uh, people that were charged with fraud. But um, it was also very good for a lot of people who had been here for a long time and were eligible for a green card and had a removal order. Um, under Trump, we saw that prosecutorial discretion was taken away almost entirely and we couldn't get cases. They were pursuing everybody. So no matter if you had entered once illegally and um, had never, had always filed taxes, never had a criminal record, they were considering you the same priority as someone who had committed murder. So, it, you know, Trump was really pursuing everybody. And now under the Biden administration, um, there was a memo that came out, it's, it's referred to as the Doyle Memorandum, that came out in 2022, actually 2021, um, and implemented uh, in 2022. And then, of course, uh, the, the, there was a lawsuit. Anything that happens that's big, there's always a lawsuit. And um, the Supreme Court recently ruled that the Biden administration had the authority to issue this new memo and guidelines for how to now uh, pursue to implement prosecutorial discretion. So what does that mean now? Um, this, the Supreme Court case came out in June 
and uh, the Doyle Memorandum has been in, has been reinstated since the end of July. This really affects people who are currently in removal proceedings, people who are currently um, going to hearings in immigration court or have been issued a notice to appear uh, before the immigration judge. Uh, if you have an attorney or, or you're one of our clients, uh, they've probably advised you that it may be possible that uh, OPLA, the Office of Principal Legal Advisor, the DHS attorney, had um, will offer you something called dismissal or PD, prosecutorial discretion. What does that mean? It could be generally it means dismissing your case that they just have there's over two million court cases pending in the immigration courts and they just don't have enough resources to pursue two million cases um, or the time to put uh, the effort into you know studying these cases and prosecuting these cases. Um, it's a little bit stressful for a lot of our clients as well as us as attorneys um, because you know we'll prepare for trial. We've worked on these cases for five plus five or more years, and you know we'll have a hearing in a couple of days or their final hearing in the following week, and uh, we'll get a message from DHS saying, "Hey, we want to dismiss your case," which um, then that requires us to have a very long conversation with our clients to discuss the benefits and the disadvantages of taking that offer. It really is an offer that could benefit a lot of people. Um, for people who do not want to risk a removal order, if they lose their case, maybe they don't have a very strong case in court, they don't want the removal order, or maybe in just a couple of years, they'll be eligible for a green card based on a kid turning 21. Um, this may be good for them because they don't have the pressure of going to court and the judge denying the case and getting a removal order. Um, but on the other hand, you would lose, you know, your ability to fight in court and you would lose your work permit, the ability to renew your work permit. The, um, it's not great for other people because, you know, this is the only relief that they have, you know, the 42B cancellation of removal or the 5A9 asylum application could be very strong. And it's the only option that they have to get their green card. They have no other option outside of court or in the future. So um, that may be a situation where we don't want to take the offer. We want to try to, um, you know, fight in court and have our day in court and try to win the case. Um, the issue is really for the people who have somewhat strong cases or uh, but a tough judge. So you don't know if you're going to win. We can never guarantee a win. And so it's really, you know, kind of a gamble. Like, do I do I go forward with this judge and really fight or do I um, anticipate that maybe I'll get denied and, and I don't want the removal order. So I would recommend that if you are in removal proceedings, um, then you talk to your attorney about whether PD will be offered, prosecutorial discretion or dismissal. Um, and if you, if you have a criminal record, if you have fraud, if you came after November 2020, you're not going to be offered dismissal. Um, you could request it still, but you're considered a priority. But everyone else who's been here a long time, pay their taxes, has no serious criminal record, has no serious fraud issues, um, came before 2020, will likely be offered um, dismissal from court proceedings. Uh, I think we have a question. Do we have a question? Yes, we do. We do have a question. And this person says, hi, I had a court in July and I didn't show up. I entered on parole. What happens now? Okay. Um, I'm curious when they entered on parole. It must have been recently. Um, but if you had court in July and you didn't show up, uh, you really need to file something called a motion to reopen. If you have, um, I don't know if you're, you know, if what kind of parole you have or if you're from Cuba, I, I, I don't know. But there um, is other relief for, there could be other relief for you, but you need to get your case reopened with court. If you didn't show up to court, then they could order you removed and you could have an outstanding removal order. What does that mean? It means that it doesn't mean that ICE will come immediately to your house, but if you have to report to ICE in the future um, because you're required under those these reporting requirements, or if maybe you get stopped for a ticket uh, or encounter ICE or uh, Sorry, if you have like a criminal issue or a traffic issue, they can refer you to ICE and see that you have a removal order and then try to execute that removal order by, you know, deporting you. So I would contact a lawyer 
and try to file something called a motion to reopen, to reopen the proceedings for, for having failed to appear and getting a removal order. Reopen, and then so you can file relief in court. So you can file your asylum application, a green card application, whatever you're eligible for. Um, because it is kind of dangerous to have that um, to have that uh, removal order issued against you. Okay, thank you very much. We have more questions today, and um, <clears throat> well, if you have any question, please give us a call. The phone number is two one six two seven nine three nine eight four two one six two seven nine three nine eight four. We have another question. Um, Hello, I didn't hear what's offered before 2020 because I have a problem. Sure. Um, what I was saying about the, the 2020 date, November 2020, is if you entered before November 2020, you'll likely be very eligible for prosecutorial discretion. If you entered after November 2020, it's harder to get your case dismissed. These are only for people who are in immigration court proceedings. These are only for people who um, maybe have a prior removal order. You can try to reopen the case and um, try to get that case dismissed because you're not a priority. You came before 2020. So um, that's what I mean by the 2020. You're going to be considered a priority or non-priority depending on when you entered. Okay. Thank you so much, Attorney Allison. Don't forget, if you need more information, the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. The next question is interesting. Uh, I am U.S. citizen born. My husband is Colombian. He was coming to the airport in Miami and was sent back to Colombia because he kind of admitted that he works for his dad here in the United States. My question is, what is the fastest way to bring him back? I am pregnant and want him to enjoy the baby when he's born and to see him grow. Yeah, I'm so sorry that happened. Um, these Miami can be tough sometimes. It's, they can put a lot of pressure on you and, and sometimes you speak out of, you, you say something out of pressure and, and uh, I'm sorry that happened to him. So there's a couple of things that could have happened. Um, they could have I would need to see the paperwork. Hopefully they didn't issue some type of order or expedited removal order. Um, they could have, I think what they might have done without looking at the paperwork is offered him to withdraw his admission. Withdrawing admission means I'll just return back to my country and I won't, just don't admit me. Um, I know the, he used to come through Atlanta. Atlanta is actually not a bad airport. Um, I, I don't want to say one is better than the other, but I do have, I hear more problems coming out of Miami um, than Atlanta and Atlanta, my clients uh, haven't had many issues. So um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Anyways, if he withdrew admission, which is a technical term, if they say, okay, you can, um, we're going to allow you to withdraw your request to, for admission and just go home. Then the question is, did they cancel his visa? Um, and and if they canceled his visa and he has no way of returning now, um, he can try to reapply for the visa, but it will be very difficult. If you are a U.S. citizen, I would recommend that you file an I-130 right away for your husband if you're married um, or a fiancé visa if you're only um, engaged um, and uh, get him back through immigrant visa processing. But it could take up to two years to get that to, to, to And I know the baby is going to be born before the two-year period. So um, if he's if his visa was canceled and he withdrew admission, you need to file an I-130 and get him back and get him the green card. If he, is, he withdrew admission and he got to keep his visa, then he could possibly come back. But I would wait a little bit longer. Don't come back so quickly if he was able to keep his visa. Um, he can try to reapply for another visa to visit, but that will be difficult because um, they will say, well, there's a reason why the visa was canceled and we're not going to issue you another one. Um, I, if you are married, I would find a lawyer or try to file that I-130 immediately, expedite it for medical reasons because you're pregnant and get him the immigrant visa to come as soon as possible. And because you are Colombian, I believe they have the parole process. So it's possible that you can get him back as soon as possible because if the I-130 is approved, they're now paroling Colombians in. Um, you could be selected for that parole process and get him here, um, get him, a, and then as soon as he comes, he can get a work permit and you can adjust his status. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Um, I see another question going back to Jimmy, who had 
had that issue with the misdemeanors after acquiring the green card. So if you have the green card and you had the criminal issues and you're in proceedings now, um, there may be a waiver for you to file in court to overcome the misdemeanors, depending on what the dis misdemeanors are, and you can get your green card back in court. Or if you got your green card and you have the criminal record and you're not, you weren't, they didn't catch you and put you back in proceedings, then um, you still need to talk to a lawyer to see if you can resolve those misdemeanors and apply for citizenship. Um, if, if you haven't traveled, I would not travel because that travel will be a problem if you, um, if you leave the United States and you come back with those two misdemeanors, they will, they will put you in proceedings um, or they could just not admit you into the United States. So, or they could detain you. Um, I would really recommend that you hire an attorney, but it sounds promising. If you did have a green card already, there's a possibility to get that green card back either in court or resolve the criminal issues and apply for citizenship. Did you, uh, did you go to the next question or uh, it was? I, I see another question about asylum. If you, you can read that one. Yeah, I can. I can read that one. But you read the one by, uh, from Jimmy Rocundo. Right? Yeah, I just answered that one. The one okay. I just. I think I, I just answered okay, Jimmy. So right Jimmy, right. please call our office if you have questions okay. or get in touch with an attorney. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next question comes. And says, my husband was granted asylum. He was the principal on the case. I received the asylum through him. He passed away a year ago. I would like to go back to my country to sell some properties that we own there and come back to the U.S. with my daughter that lives here. I have my 10-year uh, green card. I think the question is if she could travel uh, yeah. back to her country. Yeah, if you already have your green card, you can absolutely travel. The fact that he, I, I would be a little bit worried if he passed away and you didn't have your green card yet and you were still an asylee. Um, but because you have your green card, it's okay to travel. Um, if, if there's any misinformation in there, though, like I would always check with the lawyer um, so we can check your paperwork to make sure that everything lined up with the asylum and his death certificate and getting the green card. Um, I trust that that timeline is correct. But if you, if you have your green card already, uh, based on the asylum that you got through your husband, but you have your green card, you should be able to travel. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Allison. And well, we keep getting uh, some other questions. Uh, Jimmy, if you want to call the office, um, and the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Um, just one question about a prior uh, topic that we spoke before, uh, talking about, um, I think it was the Dolly, the Doyle memorandum. memorandum. Uh, is this related to admin close or, yeah, um, just dismissing a case? What is the difference between okay. those two ways to end a case? That's a great question. A lot of people actually, um, get confused about what prosecutorial discretion means under that Doyle memorandum. Prosecutorial discretion is an umbrella word. It's like an over, it's an encompassing word for any type of relief or offer that DHS can give you based on your priority or non-priority status. So it could mean dismissal. It could mean admin closure. It could mean stipulating to relief, which means they agree to uh, approve your case or grant your case. Um, uh, it could mean um, a joint motion to reopen or dismiss, um, a joint motion for you know summary dismiss, you know uh, relief in court. So uh, it could mean a lot of things. It just means that you're asking them, hey, I want to dismiss my case. I want to close my case. I want to. Um, this case is really strong. I would like for you to agree that my case is uh, approvable and that we can. Uh, come to an agreement together because when the government agrees with the attorney and um, the individual applying for relief together and they, they come to an agreement and they present that agreement to the judge, the judge is much more likely to grant it versus one party going to the judge and saying, this is a really strong case. I'd like it granted. 
The judge will then ask the government attorney, this is just how legal system works, what do you think about this case? If the government attorney says, well, I agree, or they'll say, no, I disagree, then the judge is going to say, well, we, we have, you're challenging your case, so I'm not going to just grant it. It's a lot harder. So um, prosecutorial discretion means you can approach the government for any reason, like asking for relief, admin closing, dismissing the case, reopening the case, um, so that they can come to an agreement to present to the judge. And we do file a lot of joint motions to reopen. So if you have a removal order and you have a really strong case, but you can't move forward with that case until you reopen your prior deport order or prior removal order, then you can file a request to jointly move to reopen based on you know the strength of your case or equities or whatever is going on in your case. And um, that's what prosecutorial discretion can also mean under the Doyle Memorandum. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Allison. Don't forget that the Attorney Margaret W. Wong has seven offices across the country in the city of Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland. She actually is in Chicago today. Uh, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Atlanta, Nashville, Raleigh, North Carolina, and New York. So those are the cities that she has offices at. And if you want to call, you want to make a call and make your appointment in one of the cities, you just need to call the phone number 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984 is the phone number that you need to call to talk to one of the attorneys, over uh, 15 attorneys working in the law firm. And that's uh, over 46 years of experience to the attorney, Margaret W. Wong, plus all of the other attorneys that have been prosecutors, judges, and uh, well, they have a lot of experience. So if you need a, uh, an attorney to defend your case, just call the office, the Margaret W. Wong and Attorneys uh, and Associates Office. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Uh, we have an, uh, another question. I have lived in the United States for 25 years. I have two kids, one of them has Down syndrome, and the other one is ADHD. Um, could this help get the residency for this person or get the green card? This person is from India. Yeah, so definitely talk to an attorney. Um, I think possibly it could help you. Um, there is something called cancellation of removal, which is for people who have been here for more than 10 years have U.S. citizen children, uh, U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident parents, children, or spouse, and that and those relatives that are U.S. citizens or green card holders would suffer exceptional uh, or extremely unusual hardship, including medical hardship, um, emotional, financial, logistical hardship, if you were removed. You also have to show that you have no serious criminal record and that you're a person of good moral character. Um, the problem with this case, and and if you win this cancellation of removal case, you would be eligible to stay here permanently and receive a lawful permanent resident status. The problem with this is a lot of people want to apply for this, but you're only eligible if you're in removal proceedings or in immigration court proceedings. Um, and many people are not. The only way to get into proceedings is if you're arrested and sent to court or, um, or you apply for something and, and you're referred to court. So the problem is, you know, like, are you eligible? Have you, are you now in court proceedings or have you been in court proceedings and been removed? We could reopen that removal order and then get you back in court proceedings to apply for cancellation based on your kids. Remember that the kids have to be under age of 21 to qualify uh, as a qualifying relatives for you to pursue this. Um, if you, the other thing is, are you eligible to get a green card based on your kids when they turn 21? I see that you're from India, so depending on how you entered 25 years ago, um, that could be one uh, way to get residency. If you entered 25 years ago, um, uh, we need to look at you know your entries and um, and what's happened if you've ever filed anything with immigration, which could affect uh, your case as well. But I, I think that's a very strong case. If you have sick children, if you have children uh, that are sick, especially if they're U.S. citizens or permanent residents talk to a lawyer um, because they you could possibly get relief based on those medical issues. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Allison. Don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Uh, 
3984. Um, next question, the court sent me a notice to appear to an old address. I miss my court because of that. How can I fix this uh, and go to court again? Great. This is, this is motions to reopen is what I specialize in. So I love all the uh, court questions and reopening cases. So um, if you were sent a notice to appear and you did not go to court, you were likely um, issued an order of removal. In order to proceed with your case, you need to get that case reopened by filing a motion to reopen. There's two ways to file a motion to reopen, to argue that you should be, you know, get back in court and that your motion to reopen should be granted. One is, um, is, is arguing that you, it was sent to an old address and you didn't know about the court date because of, maybe you didn't get the notice or it was because you was sent to the wrong address or because it was given to someone else or because the court didn't send it at all. Um, so it seems like you have a strong case uh, for that. Um, though you are required to keep the court updated with your address after you move. So the question is whether you filed um, to change the address of the court and if they had your right address. Um, the other way to do it is to argue that there's extraordinary circumstances that prevented you. So maybe you were in the hospital or maybe you were late for court that day or maybe um, something else happened. You didn't understand that you had to go to court uh, maybe a lawyer misguided you and told you you didn't have to go to court, which would be an exceptional circumstance. So I would seek a lawyer um, to try to reopen the case by filing a motion to reopen. If you did not know you had to go to court, you, you don't have a deadline for filing it, but you should file it as soon as possible. If you knew you had to go to court and you just didn't go for some extraordinary reason or some some circumstance, um, you have 180 days, six months to file it. So that's your deadline. Uh, I would see a lawyer as soon as possible so that you can figure out um, the best way to approach that case and whether you can apply for relief. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Allison. So how many days do we have to uh, file a motion to reopen? So for a motion to reopen based on not on failure to attend your court hearing, so that would be called if you have a removal order in absentia, which means in a removal order because you fail to appear, you have 180 days to file it if it's based on extraordinary circumstance or at any time if you did not know about the court date. But if you're filing a motion to reopen um, because you were ordered, you went to court and you were ordered removed, you have 90 days to file it, the motion to reopen. So depending on the basis of the motion to reopen, it could be 90 days, it could be 180 days, it could be any time. Uh, so make sure that you hire a good lawyer that understands those filing deadlines. Well, you, need, you know who you need to, fi uh, to hire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to uh, make you feel bad, but I know the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates they are awesome. They are really, really prepared. They are uh, very uh, trained uh, in order to go to court and defend your case. And uh, the judges respect them because they have been awarded not only the attorney Allison, but also attorney Francis, attorney Fabiola. I know they are really, really good attorneys that go and represent you in court and even the judges uh, respect them because they know that when they come to court is because they have a good case and they have good arg arguments to defend your uh, case. So please write down this phone number 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Last question for today, Attorney Allison. Um, I am waiting for you, Visa. My former partner beat me up and got arrested. I, work, I got work permit. My mom is very sick in the Dominican Republic. Can I go and wait for my U visa in the R? Okay. So U visa is different from T visa. Okay, so U visa, if you're still waiting for your U visa, I assume that you got your work permit because of the bona fide determination. Um, if you received a bona fide determination because while your U visa is pending and you got a work permit based on that, um, you... You, if you go back to the Dominican Republic while the U visa is pending, you will have to counselor process that. So you would have to then go to the consulate 
once it's approved to send your UV, you have to switch the case to a counselor processing case. You have to wait in Dominican Republic until the U visa is approved, then go to the embassy and have them issue you the proper visa to get back into the United States based on the approved U visa. It's not like you can apply for a travel document while the U visa is pending and leave and come back. Um, so if you leave, you have to wait there until the U visa is approved, then get the visa to cut through the council to come back. Otherwise, um, you're and if you go and then the U visa is denied for whatever reason, um, you could be stuck in Dominican Republic. So I would talk to your lawyer who filed it about, you know, the risks you're taking if you leave now. Because if it's a very strong U visa and everything is filed and lined up, then possibly you might want to take that risk and just go back and stay there till the U visa is approved. But if there's any issues with the U visa, with the paperwork, I would um, I would caution you not to go back because if it's denied, you're stuck there uh, with with no way to get back. Um, when the U visa, yeah, when the U visa is approved, though, it's not like a T visa. You can't travel after that until you get your green card. So, I, I that's a that's a tough situation. You're gonna have to talk to your lawyer or talk to some lawyer to review your U visa and the strength of it and whether it's worth going back and waiting there. There's a, uh, just just a, a question that came to my mind. Um, people that are waiting for U visa that have a work permit, do they qualify for advanced parole? No, they don't. For for T visa, if you're even after your U visa is approved, you can't travel. But for T visa is different, so you can travel and apply for advanced parole. The only way for if you hear about people being outside the United States and the U visas because their counselor processing that U visa that they're waiting for an approval for. Okay. And we have a last, very last question. And this is, I promise is the last one. Uh, good afternoon. What happens to the dependent of asylum applicant if they are going to divorce? Um, well, this is for a friend of mine. Yeah. So if you uh, apply for asylum and uh, a derivative or a rider on the asylum application is your spouse because you were married at that time and you can include spouses on your asylum application. If they divorce, then you'll just have to let USCIS know or the asylum office know that they are no longer your spouse and you no longer wish to include them in the asylum application. You can do it by writing a letter to them or calling them um, or you can just wait until you get the interview and then letting them know that they're no longer your spouse because if they're, I assume that they're still waiting for their asylum interview and it hasn't been interviewed yet. So you can tell them at the interview, whatever it is, or you can write them a letter um, and let them know now. Um, the, the, the wife, I think the follow up question just came, well, the wife needs to depart the country. Um, I don't know the answer to that without more information. I think it depends on what the status is of the, the spouse. Um, they're not under a deportation order, so they're not, they don't have to depart the country. Um, they're not under an order to, to depart, but they're also probably not going to be here legally anymore, but unless they had some other legal status. So I, I don't know what depends on what their status was before they filed and, um, what they'll be considered now. Okay. Um, thank you so much, attorney. And uh, I have, so my question would be, could this person, if they divorce could this person file her own asylum yeah that's actually no that's a great point yeah they can maybe just file their own asylum um after they divorce so what about the one year deadline right so for asylum you're eligible for asylum only if you file within the first year of entering the country um if if they're now filing their own and they miss that and it's not within the one year of when they last entered, then they'll have to establish some type of change circumstance or extraordinary circumstance or reasons why they, they delayed. And so one reason could be, well, I was married to someone, I had status, I lost it, or I was married to someone that filed for asylum, I was a rider for them, and now we divorce, so I'm filing my own. So that could be considered, um, an extraordinary circumstance for USCIS and overcome the one year, but it just, if, if that applies, um, and it's up to USCIS, the asylum office, whether they would accept that excuse for the one year. 
this question is a yes or no question. Can I apply for a national interest visa EB2 having an asylum pending and living in the United States? That's a maybe, <laughs> not some yes or no. That's a maybe. It depends on what your current status is. If you have lawful status right now and filed for asylum while you're in lawful status and want to apply for an NIV, um, because you, then you are eligible to file that if you're already in lawful status. The asylum would not uh, harm your NIV, eligibility for NIV um, as long as, or, or your current status that you're on legally. You just have to be in legal status now on some type of visa to apply for the NIV and applying for asylum doesn't cut that off. Okay, so, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Attorney Allison. And yeah, I think this person filed asylum before the six months uh, of stay in the United States uh, and he entered on a B2 visa. So he probably would qualify. But please, Hussam, call this phone number 216-279-3984 216-279-3984, and uh, the attorneys will be happy to answer your question. Thank you so much, Attorney Allison, and looking forward to see you soon. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a good lunch. Okay. And don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-84. The offices good attorneys they are very professional that will take care of your case over 60 people working for you over 15 attorneys working for you and the attorney market w won't have that has over 46 years of experience thank you so much have a good lunch and see you next time